Um, you can all hear me, I think, can you? Great, and see what it's in. You can see this lovely detail of the Tara brooch and you can see from it what an ornate object it is. Now, just to get it situated in time, uh, the date is approximately 700 AD, could be late seventh century, could be early eighth century, but a round figure of about 700 AD. And as for size, the diameter, and that's from, hang on a minute, uh, from here to there is 8.7 centimeters, something like that. It's extremely ornate. It's decorated or originally all over the front, though now sadly some puns have been lost, still decorated entirely over the back. Um, and it's decorated with gold, lots and lots of gold, some silver and studs of a variety of color and shape. For example, this is amber, that is amber, this is amber and gold. Uh, this one, though you can't, can't see it very clearly, that's plain blue glass. This is blue glass and gold, so is that. Then we have blue glass and red. We have more blue and red. And we even have some little violet kind of amethyst colored studs, these tinsy little heads here, and also these little studs here. Um, so it's an extremely ornate object. It's even decorated on the edges, both internal and external of the, of the hoof, body of the brooch, and indeed also of the pinhead, as you see here, uh, and the shank of the pin from here onwards. Now, it was discovered in 1850 by children playing at the back of the Strand here at Betty's Town uh, County Meath, which is just south of the mouth of the River Boyne. Um, very soon afterwards, it was acquired by this splendid character here, and I'm thrilled to have this photograph. It has just, uh, I've just discovered its existence from your, your own magazine. This is Samuel Swinburne Waterhouse, um, and he was um, a Sheffield businessman, I think, came to Dublin in the 1840s, set up business in Dame Street, Dublin, partly selling Sheffield plate, but also making replicas of Irish brooches, which he sold under very ornate fancy names. And he is responsible uh, to the misleading uh, reference to Tara in the title of our brooch. Uh, here is Tara, it's not that far away, but of course, as a marketing employee, it sounded much nicer than Royal Tara brooch rather than the Betty's Town brooch because of all the associations of the sacred site of Tara. Um, he was an extremely shrewd uh, businessman and he no sooner acquired the brooch than he was off to London to present it to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, and thereafter, he exhibited it very widely in Dublin, of course, and Belfast, but also in Paris and in London again. Now, um, it created quite a stir. So here are some of the comments uh, that were made in 1863 when it was exhibited in London. The uh, Times said that it was more like the work of fairies than of human beings, of course, referring to the minute scale of the work on the brooch. And a member of the Castellani family, now they were the great Roman goldsmiths who were famous for making archeological jewelry. Well, he said it had been worth a journey from Italy to see it. And in the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is show you why these commentators were so impressed by reviewing the various techniques used to manufacture this brooch. But before I do that, I think I should give you a little bit of background. Um, so first question is, what was it for? Well, it had an obvious practical function as a cloak fastener. Some of you may recognize this gentleman here. This is Richard Warner. Uh, former Keeper of Antiquities in the Ulster Museum. Very, you see the patient look on his face, very kindly modelled this replica of the Tower brooch. Of course, it's not the real Tower brooch by Johnson, but it is to scale. So it gives you an impression of what this brooch, the Tower brooch, would have looked like when it was worn. Now, if you look at Richard and the brooch, you can see it's quite conspicuous. And that brings me to its second function. And its second function was as a status symbol. Now, early medieval Ireland society, or Irish society was anything but egalitarian. It was extremely hierarchical 
and um, people were ranked into three main groups, the privileged caste, uh, the free, that's number two, and the unfree. But even within each category, there were various subgroups. For example, there were three grades of king, uh, depending on how many um, superior kings an individual owed allegiance to. And the top grade rank of poet, for example, was equal in status to the third rank of king. Now, we know that this brooch was an insignia of rank from a variety of sources, but the most clear explication is here, <coughs> excuse me, in a passage in the law of fostrage fees. And now, this was about fair treatment of foster children. Fosterage was very common in early medieval Irish society. And it was very important that foster children were to be treated according to the rank of their father. So here's a passage uh, specifically mentioning brooches, and I'll read it. Um, it's a well-known passage. Gold brooches with gems to be worn by the sons of kings, silver brooches to be worn by the sons of kings of territories. In other words, brooches like the tower brooch, gold and decorated with gems, only the top ranking um, individuals were to wear brooches like that. Uh, the lower ranking kings, they could only have plain silver brooches with no gems. So it's obviously then, that's a, a very important function of this brooch. Uh, we see this again in this uh, panel from Wirzox Cross in Monaster Boyce. And what's being depicted here is the mocking of Christ and not the arrest of Christ, it's often misnamed. The mocking of Christ when uh, he's displayed to the multitudes and mocked by them saying, hail king of the Jews. Now we know he's a king, not because he's wearing a crown, he isn't. The, the function in early medieval Ireland um, of, of designating the rank of king was actually taken over by brooches, uh, like the tower brooch. And, and as you can see, Christ is wearing a, a magnificent brooch here. And of course also by the, the very uh, gorgeous clothing he's wearing. So, um, our brooch then must have been worn by somebody of extremely high rank. We don't know who, of course, but it could have been a man, it could have been a woman, could have been a secular leader, or it could have been a cleric. So now to my second little bit of background, just to tell you something that you all know only too well, those of you who live near Saul and Don Patrick, in Don Patrick, of course, um, Ireland was converted to Christianity in the late fourth or early fifth century. And of course, this had a huge impact on the culture. The spiritual center there, of course, was Rome. And in the sixth and seventh centuries, Irish uh, churchmen themselves traveled and founded uh, religious establishments on the island of Britain, most famous, of course, of Iona and Lindisfarne, but elsewhere, and also on um, mainland Europe. And indeed, you're not very far away from Bangor, uh, where Colin Barnes, um hailed from. Um, now, this had its impact on the design of the Tara brooch uh, because they couldn't, if you wanted to found a realist establishment anywhere outside Ireland, you had to get, or probably in Ireland as well, you had to get the permission from the local elite to do so. That way, they came in contact with the, the, the very uh, richest members of society and most powerful, and they saw their jewellery. So this had a, a very big impact, and both on the shape and on the decoration, just to show you now briefly a little bit of the ancestry of the Tower Brooch. Start standing here with, starting here with, as it were, the grandfather, um, the ultimate ancestor. That is a type of brooch common in late Roman um, Europe, in the Roman Empire, and made of bronze here. And they're called penannular for the simple reason that they're almost circular, pain, almost circular from Latin. They have this gap here which is a very important feature, on either side of which you have a little bit of decoration. These are the so-called terminals. And then the other thing is you have a pin which swivels around the hoop and to fasten the brooch, it passes through the gap. So that type of brooch was introduced into Ireland, as I said, probably in the late fourth, fifth century, possibly with Christianity, we can't be sure. But of course, once it um, was adopted by the Irish, it was then adapted to suit local taste. And here in the middle, we have the type of brooch worn by the elite, because this is quite a, a splendid example, in the sixth or early, 
par part of the seventh century. Now, as you see, it's it's penannular still, but you see the terminals have expanded and they're very much more ornate. In this case, we've got red enamel and we have a decorative form of glass, tiny little decorative gem-like bits of glass known to us as millefiori. But you also have the pin, which is going to swivel around the hoop and then pass through the gap to fasten the brooch. Now, you'll notice that in both these cases, there's no gold and no silver. And that's because in the early years of our era, uh, for some reason, uh, gold and silver fell out of use in Ireland. There's plenty of copper. Copper was uh, found, for example, down in near in Killarney, in Loch Lane. Uh, but at that period, they, they didn't use gold. They may have tinged their brooches to make them look silver, but in fact, they didn't use silver as well as uh, gold. Now we fast forward to the tower brooch, and of course we have see a huge change here. Um, I've pointed out it's decorated with gold, and I've also pointed out all these studs, all absent, uh, of course, from these two types of brooches. And so what happened? I've got the pin, of course, I should have said, and it has a reference to the penannular shape there and the so-called terminals, but it's actually fully circular. So something happened. Uh, what that was, was they came, were, they came across the far more uh, spectacular and showy brooches worn by the Germanic elites and that these people had taken over Europe after the end of the Roman Empire uh, on the continental Europe, the Franks and the Lombards and in England, particularly up to the south of Scotland, the Anglo-Saxons. And I think that the Anglo-Saxons were the ones who had most impact, in fact, on the redesigning uh, on brooches like the Tara brooch. Now you'll notice that we have gold, I've pointed this out already, and it's fact it's gold filigree, that's um, decoration which is made of tiny little wires and granules which are attached to uh, a gold backplate. Here it is on the Tara brooch, here it is on an Anglo-Saxon disc brooch from Kent. This would be a probably late 6th, early 7th century brooch. And we have the studs that I drew attention to before. Here we have again these big studs, really quite ornate. In fact, we have square studs on the tower brooch. We also have some little square garnet studs on this Anglo-Saxon disc brooch. Uh, but we have the fully circular shape as here. And this created a bit of a problem for them because they could no longer fasten their brooches the way they were used to. Now, um, people often find it hard to visualize how a penannular brooch is fastened so i'll just go through this quite quickly it's very straightforward by the way this i photographed in the Ulster museum many years ago it's a replica of course it's not the real thing uh, but it's of a ninth century brooch it was originally called the laurea the brooch and as richard warner discovered it was found a place called lock on but the county dairy but to fasten it what you do is you first of all you stick the pin through the cloth you fasten the pin that stays fixed you cannot move the pin so you have to decide on the angle of the pin before you start then the next thing you do is you pick up the brooch head and this is so easy to do you just rotate it round, you wiggle it round and round note under the pin and then you rotate it all the way around and there you have this very secure lock and here is Richard again looking I would say even more resigned to his fate there modeling for me very kindly and uh, there you are, you see. Now, with the tower brooch, of course, you can't do that. So what, how did they get about it? Well, I think they got about it in a very Heath Robinsonian way. Uh, this time, the pin has to stay behind the brooch uh, from the get-go, okay, like so. And um, what I think they did was they, they wound this uh, chain around the shank of the pin to, as it were, secure it, anchor it. And they had actually something we don't see here. I think at the back, there's a little drawing. They had a, a cord, there's a little lug behind here. So they probably had a more better way of securing it with a, with maybe a gold, um, sorry, a purple cord perhaps. But that isn't really a very secure way of holding a very precious object like this and fairly big. I mean, there it is. So if you were the king of Northern Brega, for example, that's a, a kingdom in which it was discovered a very powerful kingdom, or even the King of Tara, and you're at your inauguration, uh, or you're presiding over the games, or you're presiding over uh, a court case. These are the sort of occasions, I think, when a, a, a brooch of this uh, splendor would be worn. You wouldn't want to feel 
insecure about your brooch. Is it going to fall off or not? And in my opinion, what they did, and this is on the basis of a suggestion made to me by Marion Campbell, who was uh, formerly the metalwork curator in the V&A, and at, but at tests and experiments, I think they were stitched in place. Now, maybe you don't see it, but this is actually sewn in place. You see, uh, this, because this is brown um, uh, Harris tweed, I, I use brown wool. Look there and there. You just hardly notice it. Richard is there modelling it. You wouldn't see that it's stitched in place, but it is. Um, so I think that that's how it was done with the sort of belt and braces approach uh, to keep it in place. Um, now, interestingly, this little detail here, I used to think that that was just a piece of decoration, which was to balance up the attachment here for the chain. But when I did my tests, I discovered, no, it had a really important function. It's a stop because you don't want, you don't want to have your pinhead going too far over here. You want to stop it. And the other thing is you need to have it at right angles pretty well to this because otherwise you put too much of a strain on the chain. So um, that's an interesting little detail, I think, which shows that there's nothing, um, you know, things have functions which one doesn't really realize sometimes without doing one's little experiments. And I think at the end, originally there was a pin. I don't know if you can see down here, but there is a, from Lagore Cranoke. It's now in Baltimore Muse, um, Art Gallery in, Wash, in, in America, but um, the Walters Art Museum. But there is a chain attached to a pin from Lagore. And I think that's probably how that was finished off. You get these little pins on Anglo-Saxon jewelry. Now down to uh, the manufacturing techniques and next question is how can you find out about them? Well the first thing is of course you can scrutinize the brooch itself particularly helpfully under magnification a hand lens or better still a microscope uh, and you can lay it flat under a microscope binocular microscope and if you do that you will sometimes find little telltale manufacturing marks not visible to the maker himself but under magnification you can find them sometimes. But of course, it's far better if you can manage it to get your uh, brooch into a research laboratory where they have proper scientific instruments. And in fact, this did happen in the case of the Tara brooch. In the early 1960s, when the Arda Chalice uh, was sent by the National Museum of Ireland to the British Museum Research Laboratory, because it was wobbling on its stem and the museum at that time didn't have a state-of-the-art research lab. They sent it to London for conservation and with it went the Tara brooch and at that stage uh, they did quite a lot of investigations. Now it's not published I'm afraid, uh, the Tara brooch findings, but Robert Organ who was the lead uh, investigator in, at that time and a very helpful person as far as I've been concerned, he kindly gave me a lecture he gave on the making of the tar brooch, which if I'm spared, I really must get published someday. So I will be drawing on, on Robert's lecture quite a lot during this talk. Now, you can also get information about ancient technologies from some ancient manuals. There are classical ones, Pliny, for example, gives quite helpful information sometimes. But the big useful text, uh, as far as Middle Ages is concerned, is a 12th century text by Rhenish monk called Theophilus, and it's in Latin, but in the English name is on the diverse arts. Now, of course, I've just said it's 12th century, but really technology didn't change an awful lot uh, after the Roman Empire. So a lot of the techniques that, that, that Theophilus described go way back to the Roman world and earlier, um, and are certainly applicable to, to um, early medieval Irish or medieval Irish uh, metalwork. Now, we don't have any um, old Irish or early middle Irish goldsmith's manuals. Uh, there was in fact uh, a law tract about the Caird, that was the silversmith of the fine metal workers, but that sadly hasn't survived. But uh, Brian Scott, uh, who indeed lives not too far away from you, I imagine, uh, probably in Belfast, I'm not sure, but he has studied uh, the vocabulary of old and early um, Irish middle texts. And as he points out, you can pick up terms for alloying, refining, gilding and so on. So in the in the language of Old Irish there's there's indications of uh, an understanding of metallurgy. And finally of course there's metalwork debris found in excavations. Now 
what we're going to do is review the making of the tower brooch. And if you're going to make it, the first thing you have to do is you have to design it. Now, if you look at the front and the back of the brooch, you will notice a lot of curls, curves or arcs, which rather suggests the use of a compass. You will also notice nice straight lines there or there, again, suggesting the use of a straight edge in the design. And very fortunately, uh, we have, we have two trial pieces. They are trial pieces because they're trying something out. Uh, one from Nendrum, not very far from where you are. Um, and the other is actually from Donad, which was probably the chief secular site in Scottish Thalriada. And what I've done, apart from there, there's to show you a straight edge there. When they didn't use straight edges, things went a little bit awry there with a bit of a little bit of freehand, but particularly to show you the, the points of compasses there 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 so it's perfectly clear that and it makes sense of course from looking at the design that they use compasses and straight edges but there's much more to it than that because um an american scholar sadly died about two years ago i think uh, professor robert stevick from the university of washington um, based in seattle and um, he loved puzzles and he figured out uh very cleverly that the, the this Donad uh, brooch here was designed using ratios and the ratio that was used in this particular case was the golden section and the golden section as I'm sure you all know is it's a question of dividing a line into two uneven parts so the ratio of the whole line to the larger part that's a plus b to a is the same as the ratio of a the larger part to b the smaller part um, and he also discovered, uh, actually at my best, I asked him to look at this. He said, oh, no, it won't work. But then he went away and worked it out that this ratio was also used in the designing of the tower brooch. Now, here are a series of steps that he published uh, to design uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, back of the tower brooch. And I'm not going to go through them all because that would take too long. And I don't think I find it very easy to do so, actually. But I'm just going to go along the first line. This is how you get your golden section. You draw a, section, a circle. This is without any measurements. Draw the circle, divide it into four quadrants. Then what you do, you divide the radius in half. Now with this. And that can be done very easily by drawing this arc from here with the same radius. And at these points where it crosses the uh, circumference, you just join these two points. Then what you do is you put the point of your compass here and the radius is up to, to this point here. So it's, it's bigger than the radius itself. Here it is. You strike an arc and you've got your own section from the center. This is A and that is B. And once you've got these two measures, you can then repeat them or double them. For example, here, you've doubled B from the center. Well, that's simple to do because you, you've worked out what it is. You, and you draw this uh, arc here, which is actually the inner edge of the hoop. And you see here, they've got B again, and they have A, the longer part. And you go through all these steps, and I'm not going to do it now, and you end up with um, the outline of the back of the tower brooch. Now, when you design things in this way, not doing freehand work, but basing it all on geometry. So the whole design is underpinned by geometry. One of the consequences of this is you get perfect accuracy and um, quite extraordinary, uh, you know, absolute perfection, even on a tiny scale. This is a panel on the back of the brooch, which I'm going to sneeze, I'm afraid, sorry. <coughs> so sorry. Um, which is this drawn out here by the late Professor Gunter Hansloff. Uh, as you see, from here to here, there to there, 18 millimetres, so really pretty small scale. And it's decorated with the most dense but wonderful pattern in what's known as the ultimate Latin style. Now, I'm sure many of you know that the Latin um, period or is, is named after a site where it was first identified in Switzerland, and it's the Iron Age. The Latin, the Latin style is, is the kind of Celtic art dated to the Iron Age. And it's been aptly 
nicknamed the swirly style because it's full of swirly patterns. Now this is this is this is its its sort of early medieval incarnation in Ireland. Lots of swirly patterns. You see there, off we go, swirl, and there's a real sense of swirl and movement. Also characteristic of this style is the fact that the lines are not even. Now that's a big contrast with uh, classical art. If you think of sort of borders on Greek vases and so on. The line is always even, but not in uh, the Latin or indeed the ultimate Latin style. So for example, I think, let's let's look at this one. We have we have a little kind of club shape here, expansion. The line is thin, and then it expands, meets this lentoid, in fact, it meets a leaf, and then it starts to shrink again. Expands again here, and round it goes again. Um, and I could do this in various places, but, uh, this is what you get in very typically the so-called trumpet pattern. Now, I'm sure that the ancients didn't call this a trumpet pattern, but antiquarians looked at this style where you have an expansion with a dividing lentoid and then it shrinks again. And they imagine two trumpets together like kissing trumpets. So that's known as a trumpet pattern. And you can get, there you are. That's where that is over there. And you typically also of this style are trumpet spirals where you have We've seen this line before, it expands into a trumpet pattern, and then we go round into a spiral, and that is actually there. And you get this wonderfully accurate um, depiction, in, but completely underpinned by geometry. Now, this is the panel we've just been looking at. So we're now going to look at a non-geometrical pattern. There's also extreme accuracy in the non-geometrical patterns. And we know from manuscripts, for example, the uh, Lindisfarne Gospels, for example, on the backs of pages, you can see grid patterns. So there, there's, uh, there's an underlying grid pattern. And what we have here is four births. Uh, well, we won't, we'll look at that in a minute. This one is biting the leg of the one in front. This one is biting the legs of the one in front. So is this one. And this one at the end has nobody to bite, so he just turns his head back. But what I'm trying to show you here, or I'd like you to look at, are the wings. Notice the trumpet spiral. That it, it's like, you know, it's if you think of if you're trying to learn a foreign accent, it's very, very difficult to get the pronunciation absolutely perfect. So these little trumpet pat spirals are introduced into bird, birds, which are actually borrowed from Mediterranean because it's, you know, they have it, they have an Irish accent. So if these birds could squawk, we would hear their Irish accent. But by the introduction of this trumpet spiral, you see it's interlaced and here is one. And then we have the next one here. Have I got an arrow? You see there's the next one, the next one, and this one. And we're looking on the real thing now. Look, there, 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 and there. So remember, these are only four to five millimetres across. So we're really talking tiny. We're talking about something like the work of fairies, you know, as the Times of London commented. Uh, the, the accuracy of these designs is really extraordinary. So, so, so good then for that. Once you've designed your book, you have to make it, and it's made in a number of different bits, actually seven different bits. Uh, there is the body of the brooch, that's made in one bit. Then you have the, the um, plate of the pinhead uh, there. You have, you have a, a, an arch, a loop on the back of the pinhead, that's a separate bit attached. You have the shank of the pin there. Uh, you have an attachment for the chain and you have the chain and probably a um, pin at the end of the chain. So seven, seven se separate bits. Now, how are they joined together? They're joined together in a way which is very typical of early medieval Irish metalwork and it joined together mechanically. And looking here now, um, this is a wonderful photograph taken during the conservation in the British Museum. There you have uh, the back of the pinhead and you have got these so-called lug and pin joints. You see there are pins going through some little lugs in there. There is another bit of pin, it goes right through there. And if we look over here, you can see how we can see the pin, which is actually, you see there, we can see part of the pin. So that's how the um, the loop on the back of the pin head and the shank of the pin are joined together. Oh, oh sorry. Um, we have then the shank of the um, pin itself. That slots into a little 
socket in here and there's I don't know if you can see but there's a rivet head here and a rivet head here so that's again mechanically joined and you have more lug and pin joints there and so on um but so going a step backwards now to the making of these various components and they were the in the main apart from the chain of course uh they were cast um and they're cast in silver uh with sockets on the front these sunken compartments they would have been for the filigree panels there's one there there's another there one there and so on then of course you also have little uh, cells to hold the studs here all the filigree panels have been taken out the studs are still in place there and there's also some integral decoration there which is cast the body of the brooch as i said a moment ago is made silver and you can see that quite plainly where the ornament has been lost but what is very interesting is that when the brooch was intact and finished you did not see silver at all you the body of the brooch is a silver but it's all concealed and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to talk about the four different ways in which the silver was concealed on the brooch and that would cover all the manufacturing techniques well, first of all, there's mercury gilding. Uh, there's filigree, which we saw a minute ago. That's only on the front face, not on the back, because it would probably snag if it was on the back. And it's ni nice sunken, uh, sunken compartments on the front, which to protect it, I think. Starts we've seen already. And then we, we've already seen a black and silver panel on the back. And there's also, there's two of those. And there's a copper and gold uh, pan panel also on the back. So this is the four different methods of covering the silver and we're just going to work our way through them one by one starting off with the mercury gilding well we've already seen the gold there and that's all mercury gilding here there as well the cast ornament it's slightly worn off there on on the margin but generally speaking it's it's still intact now this was a technique which still survives. I saw um, a, a film recently about Africa and about gold mines in Africa and how they, how they, um, they, they, they um, retreat. They they use mercury uh, in that process. Very dangerous because I'm sure you all know that mercury is highly toxic. But what they did was they they broke up little fragments. They probably hammered the gold flat. They broke it into lots of little tiny fragments, and then they. They mixed it with mercury and they they started around. So they had a kind of slush and then they painted it on the areas that were to be gilt. And then the next thing was they heated it up and the mercury will evaporate and off it goes. And the silver, the, the gold will then adhere to the silver. Um, the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland is somebody who has been using mercury in the manufacture of hats and that's why he's mad and unfortunately I imagine that in the goldsmiths in the early in early medieval Ireland and indeed late antique world and, and medieval Europe generally this is how it was done and they probably did suffer the effects but didn't understand why so that's mercury gilding now they were economical with their gilding they didn't waste it so for example if you look here at this panel which originally contained a filigree panel you see there's the mercury the gilding all along the wall because you'll see that but they're not bothered about the floor because you're not going to see it and they're not bothered about this nasty looking rivet head either because again it's going to be concealed out of sight out of mind that was how they operated and here you'll notice this large expanse of uh, silver on the pin but actually when i was playing around with replicas this is actually in the vna this particular one but it's to scale and what you see what happens you thread your um your your pin into your fabric and actually you've totally covered up this plain silver area and then the bit that emerges you see the bit that emerges from behind the brooch that's all very ornate and decorated so that's an interesting little detail and another interesting thing is that it, it, one might puzzle and think, well, it's made of silver. Why bother to use a precious material like silver? It's all going to be hidden. But there's a very interesting little passage in uh, an early Irish saga in Old Irish and therefore probably more or less contemporary with the tower brooch. <coughs> and it's describing the treasures that um, our hero, Froik, gets from the other world. And they include something 
which is described as being made of aragus, silver, for Dior, silver under gilding. Now, I think that's very interesting because on, say, the Darien Frank pattern, there's a lot of, of bronze or copper alloy under gilding. And of course, metals were ranked uh, according to the classical system, gold at the top, silver next, um, bronze next. So it's obviously significant to own a brooch of gold, of silver, I should say, even if you can't see the silver. Now, uh, next way of covering up the silver is, of course, the filigree pans, and that's what we're going to look at now. You've seen this uh, photograph already, but what you haven't seen are the panels that they came from it. That uh, panel came from there. That came from there, that compartment. That one came from there. And the, the final one down here, which I can just, just about see, uh, that one uh, came from the pinhead, so that's why we can't see its compartment here. Now, how were these uh, panels secured? Well, there was a, a way which is unique to Ireland, I think. I've looked at a lot of um, metalwork over the years from different parts of Europe, including Scandinavia. And I did think, oh, maybe this is something used by the Vikings or the Scandinavians, well, but no, and it's not used by the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, we early medievalists in Ireland, we call them jeweler stitches, but modern jewelers don't call them they actually call them bead settings or milligraining. And I've actually seen um, a, 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 somebody setting diamonds using, using this technique. So it's a very secure technique when it's new. Uh, it's very straightforward. They have a little tool with a spade end, they stick it in and they scrape the metal out. And as the metal is they do that, it gets displaced, and what it does is it curls. It curls over the filigree panels and it pins them in place very securely around the year AD 700. But of course, after a thousand years or more in the ground, um, there's there they are, by the way. Look, you see now, this is mainly what you see little scars with the silver showing behind. And silver, as you know, is a metal that corrodes. Gold doesn't, but silver does. Of course, now they're not very effective anymore. And as a result, I think that we have this terrible situation. 28 compartments for filigree on the front of the brooch, 10 panels missing. And I will count them. One there, one there, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All lost their filigree panels. But if you look on this side of the screen, you can see this engraving by Waterhouse, published in 1852. You can see there's just one panel missing. There's plenty of evidence actually to prove that these panels were all in place when the brooch was found. But of course, as I mentioned, Waterhouse exhibited the brooch hither and yon. And once the, the jeweler stitches had corroded, the little filigree panels, which are light and small, fall out very easily. And so, they fell and were not retrieved. But we do have photographs of some of them, believe it or not. Look at those two, empty now, decorated on Waterhouse's engraving, wood engraving it is. And here we have a photograph, 19th century photograph uh, by Margaret Stokes, who was a great antiquarian. And you see, look, there are the panels still in place. There's a little inaccuracy in Waterhouse's wood engraving because uh, normally, decoration is bilaterally symmetrical, so in mirror image. So he has um, little S and Z, little S and Z scrolls uh, in opposition. Actually, interestingly, on the original, look, the, they're all Z scrolls facing the same direction. But otherwise, this is this is accurate. Next is the question of the filigree itself. How was it made? Now, I said that the technique was mainly learned from Anglo-Saxon goldsmiths and it would have had to be learned directly. You couldn't, it's like you see a delicious cake in a shop window, you can't just go home and make it, you've got to have the recipe. So uh, they would have had to learn directly from foreign goldsmiths. But looking at um, early medieval Anglo-Saxon filigree, the techniques there all derive from activity, antiquity and they are very limited in range. This is the, has the starring role in the decoration. Uh, it's a type of ornamental wire used to 
outline the motifs, so-called beaded work, because it looks like a succession of little beads there. Easy to make. You have a little swage like this. It's got a groove underneath and two teeth there. And what you do is you roll it over a round wire, backwards and forwards, and as you roll it, the teeth cut around the circumference off the round wire and you end up with little beads. It's quite simple. And you just move your swage from bead to bead and that can be done by touch. You don't have to see it. When you do this, this by hand, you can't close the beads entirely. That is a photograph of a late Roman beaded wire from the set for treasure, taken under scanning electron microscope. So you can see, you get this medial seam. So it's the two bits of displaced metal from here, displaced metal from there, and it unites to form a little bead. So that's one type, the main type. Granules, very straightforward and easy to make. They're, you just get a little chip of metal, you melt it, and as it cools, it coalesces on a counter surface friction into a little sphere. Then you have cables. In other words, uh, wires twisted together. You have on Anglo-Saxon work, this is typical, you get the two ply uh, cables of plain wire and you get the three ply beaded cables. Sometimes these um, basic decorative forms are juxtaposed to found compound forms. This is one which goes way back to late antiquity, to in fact Etruscan times. It's, it's one of these cables, two ply twists there. And you juxtapose it with another one, but of course you have to be seriously careful. You get the twists aligned to make it look as if it's a plait, but you see it's two separate strands. Um, so that's the basic type of ornamental wires that you will get on late 6th to 7th century Anglo-Saxon filigree. Now, this is what you find on the Tower of Roach. These are the basic forms, really a wide range eight basic forms, and then you get the various combinations. So it's an altogether much wider range than you would find on any in surviving Anglo-Saxon filigree. Now, there is, a, there is a sort of black hole uh, for the eighth century. So there may be more like this there, but on present evidence, this is very typical of early medieval top quality uh, gold filigree and not at all typical of Anglo-Saxon filigree, certainly not typical of the prototypes um, that the Irish goldsmiths learned from. Now I've ringed three decorative forms, one simple one, twisted a ribbon, that's probably learned from the Franks, or the Merovingian Franks, because that's very typical of their filigree. And then you have these combinations now, to my knowledge, in late 6th to 7th century Anglo-Saxon filigree, you don't get these combinations. You get one example of this three Ply, plain twist, one example of this little conical spiral, and one example of this, which is beaded wire, hammered flat, and set on edge, or on the Staffordshire Hall, which is that newly discovered Anglo Saxon hoard. But so, what's, what's particular and characteristic of the top quality early medieval Irish metalwork is this, in the filigree at least, is this huge variety, but it's not messy, it's totally organised. And so here now is the image you saw at the beginning of this talk of one of the terminals of the tar brooch. And here we have a side compartment. There we go all the way around the central panel on the terminal. And so we have different forms of filigree used to outline the patterns on the side compartments from there and also on the bridge between the two terminals, as you'll see. These little panels on the side compartments, they're different patterns, but they are not technically united. They're all outlined by a beaded wire, hammered flat and set on edge. So that's why you get these very fine tops. Uh, the animal there, there's his head. I don't know if you can see his eyes, his snout and his neck. He's outlined by a beaded wire sitting on top of another. Maybe you can just see it there. I hope you can from that angle. And then over here on the bridge, Instead, oh, I don't know if you can see that. I'll move on. Yeah, you see that there's the side compartments again with their beaded wire hammer flat set on edge there. And here we have a beaded wire sitting on a ribbon on edge. So you get a different effect. You see, you get more depth there. This work is usually so perfect. You can blow it up on a screen if you're giving a lecture and it can be a huge screen and it's all perfect. So let's have a little look at this detail. That is actually from the counterpart of this panel on the other side. It's not this one, but it's its, it's partner. Now, this is an interlace, and in interlace, 
just as in those plaits, they don't genuinely plait the wire. In interlace, they don't genuinely interweave the strands either. They have the strand that goes over, is okay, there it is. But what they do with the strands that are supposed to go under, they just cut them off at each end and then they just push them up against there. So it looks as if the this strand is disappearing under there. So we have over, under, over, under, over, under, okay. It looks, it, it follows the interest. But I had to show you this because there is, shock horror, a mistake. This is so rare to have a mistake. There you are, went a bit wrong there. It's really rare to get a mistake on the, on the tar road. You see, this is only four millimeters across. So this is very, very fine work. So there you are, even Homer nodded. Moving on now to the studs. There are two types. There are amber studs, as I mentioned at the beginning, and then there are the curled ones, which are the glass studs. So we'll start with the amber studs. Um, there's a, quite a lot of amber on the brooch. That's amber, for example, there. Uh, these are amber there, there as well. But I'm going to concentrate on the big ones, which I have ringed. Uh, this is a detail, this is blown up, of that one here at the junction of the hoop and terminals, that one there, and then these on either side of the bridge. The question I'm now going to ask is, how are these amber studs held in position? And um, they're, they're quite big, you see they're still there, they haven't fallen out. And in fact, when the brooch was in the British Museum, they took them out of their cells and when they turned them upside down, lo and behold, they have little pegs at the back and left on the brooch, you see in the cells we have these ugly little holes, but it doesn't matter, you don't see them, you don't see the pegs. So that would be pegged in place there. And that was obviously a secure way of holding that these big studs in position. We'll move on now to this pretty little gold panel with little sea scrolls, very delicate little pattern there, sitting on the top of the stud. How are those little toppings, little filigree toppings, secured. It's the same idea. The discovered by Mavis Pimpson of the British Museum of Precise Stuff, who worked on the glass and also on the glass on the RI Chalice, by the way. Um, this amber stud is drilled. She's put a little, this is looking at it, it's got a little hole. And you have to imagine that this is a, set up a bit like an umbrella with a canopy and a stem. So here's the top of the umbrella. There it is, it's detached and it's soldered to a tiny little cylinder, the stem of the umbrella, as it were, which is threaded through that hole, which of course we can't see. And um, the, the tube is, is longer than the hole. The ends are snipped. And then these little tabs are just bent back and that holds this entire unit in position. There. Of course, the little cylinders are tiny. That, there is one. And you notice it's lost this little, little roundel from the top. That is actually this, this little stud here. It's lost its roundel, but the stem is still, the, uh, this little cylinder is still in position. Now, here we see again, Margaret Stokes photograph. What do we find? This is actually this, this stud, that's this one. Uh, diameter, by the way, about 10 and a half millimetres as a whole. Look, it's got another of those pretty little roundels with sea scrolls. And the pinhead there, that too uh, was decorated with a similar uh, roundel. The um, only one which we don't have a photo of, which is now lost, is this one on the inside of the bridge. But it was probably matched the one that is intact here. That would make sense. And it, it is how it's illustrated as well. So we can reconstruct these, uh, the appearance of these lost details. There's one little thing you may have picked up when you saw this before. I didn't draw attention to it, but I've only really registered this quite recently, despite the years I've been looking at this object. And that is where the, this, this uh, amber stud is missing. Underneath it, as you can see, there was a little piece of metal foil because look, you can see it's cracked there. And it's also got a little rib pattern on it. Can you see that? I hope you can. Now that is, we know what that's about because on, on the Anglo-Saxon, uh, and indeed not just Anglo-Saxon, this is right across Europe, um, 
gold and garnet. This is garnet, twas on it work. Twas on all these little step cells that the little garnets pieces have been cut out to fit into. But do you see there, because garnet is translucent, it, it would be rather dull. So to make it reflect light more interestingly, underneath here, we have little gold foils. And you can see a very similar pattern. Do you see? Little crisscross pattern there. So that is where you have an, a hidden influence, uh, which they're trying to copy uh, from um, Germanic jewellery, possibly Anglo-Saxon, not necessarily because it was quite widespread, widespread this. And nowadays, of course, uh, you wouldn't, you can't see a little metal foil here, if it, and probably there is one there, because this has been in the ground and the amber has become quite milky. But it's quite possible that originally this was also translucent, so you would have got an interesting little glitter there. Now, last us our next uh, decoration. And uh, how do we know that we're looking at glass? Now, what we're looking at here is this little blue glass stud, which was taken out of its setting from here at the tip of the pinhead, sitting on, this is this is an irregular crisscross. This is a little lead pad. And that was just for adhesion. The little, so the, the, the glass stud from here sat in its little cell over a lead pad and we know it's glass because in the British Museum, what they did was they coated it with a substance called toluene. They photographed it through that and up come these very obvious bubbles, more bubbles. And if you see bubbles, you've got glass. You don't have a precious stone. So we, that's how we know that they are glass studs. And even these little tiny little amethyst colored heads, which I mentioned at the beginning, there are only a few millimeters across. When the tar brooch went to the British Museum and recited stuff, they were terribly excited. They thought, oh, wonderful, we've got a carved amethyst. But when they looked into it a little bit more, they discovered, no, these are little cast heads. You see, there's the eyes, the little hair, nose and mouth, and there's a little matching one there. So they're cast too. They're all cast glass. I should say glass. That this is, you have a variety. You have blue glass with um, gold topping. You have just integral pattern. There's a, a cable and a, a dot and a little ring around it. And then you have blue and red. And I've given away my little surprise, which is how they made what they were cast. And we know they were cast because some actual uh, moulds have been discovered. And not only that, uh, from Nagore Cranog in, in southern Brega, um, you have this wonderful discovery of a, a green glass study in its mould. So there you go. You can't argue with that. You see the little pattern? It's all the same, this little step pattern. So there you have a clear case of the glass stud being cast in a mould. From Iona, there are other moulds that have been discovered with these different kind of patterns, little geometrical interlaces. And the most recent discovery came from a site in Scotland, Port Mahamuk, but it's in Pictland, well, Pictish language being different, but the name, as has been pointed out by Catholic scholars, such as Maura Herbert, for example, Port Mahamuk is actually derived from the Irish, the old Irish, Port Mahalum Og. It's a pet name of Cullum, uh, the port of my little Cullum. You have these Malasha, you have these little pet names, hypocristic names. And so there is obviously an Irish connection there from the name, it suggests that it was a Columban foundation. Anyway, here we have a mould and here we have the pattern in the mould. Now I'd like you to look at that pattern a little bit more closely. You see you have a circle, you have these little T shapes, one, two, three. Then you have, they're under arches, one, two, three and they're divided these little t's by radial lines one two three now why do i think that's particularly interesting because that's the pattern pretty well underlying this red and blue stud on the back of the tar brooch it doesn't look like it at first but when you draw out the pattern and this is a new drawing done recently for me make something called simon pressy a beautiful drawing what I asked Simon to do was just colour code it. And once it's colour coded, you're not distracted by the red and the blue. You can see the underlying pattern. So you have the T shapes, one, two, three, as you have in Port Mahoma, one, two, three. You have the arches in this case conjoined, one, two, three. 
one, two, three, and then you have the radial lines bisecting the T's. One, two, three. And what the, the Tara Brooch uh, uh, Smith has done is actually decided to vary it a little bit. And this, as we go along through this, well, we've already seen it with the filigree. They very much like to ring the changes. So it's really concealed uh, the fact that this is the underlying pattern. Now this is, this is gilt silver. And what it looks like, I think, is it looks as if these bits of glass are in little cells. And this is just the top of the walls of the cell. There. Uh, what it looks like is um, garnet Kozani work, which we saw a moment ago in that detail from Sutton Hoo. This is an example of this brooch from Lombardy, actually, Italy. And Kozani work is called Kozani work from the French croissant, which is a cell. And you see lots of little cells made of strips of gold, bent shape, and sold it to a gold base plate. And all these little cells are all ready to receive the garnet, or possibly glass. This is an Anglo-Saxon uh, sword button attached to a sword harness. And this is one side view, and this is a front view. And you can see the same little T-shapes that we have there. We've already seen these T-shapes. And this one is empty, because the garnet's fallen out, but this one is not. And so you see there's there, there the, the tar brooch start looks as if it's made like this, but it isn't because they couldn't get garnet. And now we know that it's made of glass because look here, the bubbles. So it's made of glass. So what did they do? Well, something very ingenious. Now, um, this is again the work of Mavis Bimson and she actually did experiments to prove that this worked. This is a start from the Arda Chalice. And as you see that the Arda Chalice uh, makers were much more interested in classical effects with their studs. They didn't go around subdividing their little T's and then putting two different colours. They, they allowed the basic pattern to show up. So you have red T's, red T's and blue between them. So what they did to make this is it looks like little cells, but it is not. It's skin deep. What they did was they started off with a little dome bit of metal. This is part of Mavis's experiments actually, cut out little shapes and you keep on cutting out. So you get the little T-shape. This is not quite the same, but it's similar. Little T's, these are four of them. You can see them linked to the center. And so that's, a, that's just a little grill and quite thin, in fact. And that's that, as it were, the grill, reimagining the grill made, used to make this start, then gets put into a mold and what this is, is the mold, but it's been sliced into notionally. We wouldn't, just to show what goes on inside, of course, we wouldn't see inside otherwise. So it gets put inside a mold and it, you can see, of course, it goes all the way around. But we're, we're looking, this is the bit in the mold and we're looking in there. And then what they did was they had to be incredibly careful. They got the red glass and the red glass was um, composition was something you couldn't really heat up very much because if you did, it turned a horrible greeny black colour. So they treated it a bit like butter, they softened it and they put the little bits of softened red glass into the T-shapes. There they are in the mould. This is being cut off here, but it's another T-shape at the beginning of all you see. And, but you mustn't let it overlap because if you do, it will show because what happens then is you can melt blue glass and then you pour in the molten blue glass. And in fact, really, it's a blue glass stud. It's got a little thin bit of red glass and even thinner, probably, bit of metal grill. Uh, so it's a very uh, ingenious way of copying uh, go, uh, garnet claws on work, but they couldn't get the garnet. They just weren't on the distribution pattern. So they, 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 they made it as best they could. Moving on now to the final method of concealing the gold body of the brooch. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have, we have uh, gold and copper color panel here, that's that one. And then we have uh, the detail we've seen before, these black and silver panels. So next question, uh, how were these made? By the way, I'm showing you there the rivets which hold them in place. And because we've seen the end of the rivets there, you see, that's what they're, that's what they're for. And as I mentioned before, of course, that would be covered up so you wouldn't see them. There's rivets. Right, now, here we have close up at uh, the panel, the, the gold and copper colored panel 
on the center of the hoop on the back, a most beautiful ultimate latent pattern, three roundels joined by these links, one and roundel number three, one, two, three. And there here's the linking um, trumpet patterns and so on. How were they made? Well, I, here we are, the answer. What was discovered in the British Museum was that the gold here has been cut in open work and it's not big again, this, looking at the cord there, there to there, it's two and a half centimeters. So it's not big um, and they're cut out. And so what you see is the copper color panel underneath it. So this uh, gold is adhering, probably soldered to the copper underneath. It's a most perfect pattern, again, because of course of the geometry, but it's an exquisite piece of craftsmanship as well. And just to show you how fantastic it is, there's this panel, this little detail there. That's what we see here. It's this little detail here. And what it is, if we look over here, it's a, it's a spiral, trumpet spiral. Up we go here, there's the leaf shape. And then we go around there, there's a little crescent. And then there's a matching spiral. And that's what we're looking at here. Here we are looking at this little bit. Up we go, leaps, then toyed. Broad, gets narrow, round we go. And here is the crescent shape which is there and that's the other matching spiral. I mean I just think this is extraordinary craftsmanship. It's just so perfect and on such a minute scale. We move on now to um, the panel we've seen a number of times before which is the silver, silver and black one of them on the back of the brooch. Now this time we have silver and the background is in black. So there's a color contrast. And you might think, oh, well, that's how they run the changes here. They just change the colors. But you might be getting a bit suspicious now after you've seen how this mindset is to ring the changes again and again. And if you are getting suspicious, you will be completely spot on because actually this is not a sheet of gold, that is a silver, I should say, that's been cut out and put over a black panel. It's not. What they discovered in the British Museum was that actually this silver had been molten. So what's happened here is something rather different. This black background has been, it's had, the background has been scooped out. So these, these are in false relief and the, the, all the background there is sunken, slightly sunken. And what they've done is they've flooded it with sil molten silver and they've polished it up. So the little raised bits which are in false relief stand out which is extraordinary that they went to all the trouble to do this a different way. But that's not all there is to it. There is the question of what is this black material? It used to be believed until the brooch went to the British Museum that this was uh, niello. Uh, niello is black compound of metallic sulphide. It's actually very rare in early medieval Irish. And metal work, very rare indeed. Uh, you do get it commonly in Anglo Saxon work, but anyway, that's not what this is. When they did an analysis, which wasn't a very detailed analysis, it was just a rough analysis, what they discovered to their surprise was that actually this black material, the major component in that is actually copper, which was a very big surprise. How come copper could be black? Now, I think, and I can't prove it, because uh, we haven't had uh, analyses made of that subsequently. So we don't have a detailed breakdown of the composition of that black metal. But um, after this work was done in the British Museum, there was a, a wonderful rediscovery in scientific laboratories and sort of magic of science. They discovered uh, black metal like that, or here, this is Japanese, they discovered that it was um, something was the Romans probably called Corinthian bronze, still practiced in Japan up to the 19th century and still in China in the 20th century. The Japanese call it shakudo, and I apologize for my Japanese pronunciation, uh, and the Romans probably called it Corinthian bronze. What that was, um, and it was described by the ancients as an alloy of copper with gold, typically small amount of gold, one to five percent gold, small amount of silver and a little bit of arsenic. And, and what happens is this alloy is then pickled in a hot aqueous 
solution containing a variety of salts and you get a patina on the top. It's just skin deep of black. And to, it, it, it really has been used to huge decorative effect. You get it in, my, in late Bronze Age uh, Greek, work nicely. And if you go to the Natural Museum in Athens, you'll see some wonderful daggers. This is an ancient Egyptian example. There are Roman examples. And this is a Japanese example and beautiful Chinese examples. And it, what you can do then is you inlay with metal. And so the black background is, has got this wonderful Gold, uh, gold inlay, and the ja I mean the the Japanese went even farther and had all sorts of different metals to make this one wonderful pattern here on this salt guard, and um, I think that that's what they had on the top brooch. Now you may say, is there any evidence for this technique in the period? The answer is yes, there is, and that's what gave me an idea of looking. Um, it was discovered some little rivet heads of all things uh, on a ninth century Anglo-Saxon. I forget what it was, some piece of Anglo-Saxon work, was actually patinated in this way. And there have been a few more finds from Anglo-Saxon England. Nothing really spectacular like you get on the Tower Brooch. But that technique was around in the early Middle Ages, which is, I think, another reason for uh, believing that that's what it probably is uh, on the Tower Brooch. So what on earth is going on here with all these variegations and varieties and changes and everything the same but different. Now, the best explanation I've come across was from the great art historian Ernst Gombrich uh, when he was talking about um, patterns. He talked about the logic of Vanity Fair and I'll read what he said because it's wonderfully expressed. The logic of Vanity Fair is whereby patrons and craftsmen seek to outdo each other for the sake of attention, prestige and fame. Once competition becomes settled on one particular feature, it lies within the logic of the situation that this line will be followed as long as the game is worth the candle. If intricacy becomes the critical issue, it's in intricacy that artists and patrons will want to overtop each other. Given the right conditions and the right craftsmen, the combination may culminate in such extremes as the Book of Kells. And he could have said the Arda Chalice, the Tara brooch, the Darren Van Patten, or indeed the Hunterson brooch, which is a similar brooch uh, in the National Museum in Scotland. Of course, these brooches had an afterlife, which is actually extremely interesting. Uh, I mentioned that Waterhouse was marketing replicas, and this is my grandmother uh, wearing a replica of a Tara style brooch. There she is uh, from Macrofelt, County Derry. So you see, I have northern blood coursing through these veins here. And my grandfather was actually from, well, by fast, but from Draperstown. So there you are. There's my grandmother wearing a Tara style brooch. But that, of course, is a whole other story, the story of the replicas, and I can't go into this here. There you are, there's her brooch. Now, of course, I'm indebted to many, many people um, for the sources of this talk, obviously the staff of the National Museum of Ireland uh, for permission to examine the brooch and for photographs. Um, I've also got photographs by a colleague of mine, Barbara Ambruster, who is from the CNRS in, in France, she's an archaeometologist. She took a number of photographs when we were in the National Museum together. Um, uh, then there's Robert Organ, of course, um, the late Robert Organ, who was so kind and gave me so much information. And uh, equally, Mavis Bimson, who's in her 90s now, worked on the studs and she's been very helpful. And there's been photographs retrieved, photographs taken in the 1960s, retrieved by Susan and Nice and scanned by these individuals. So I'm indebted to everybody. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to answer questions if you have any. There, stop sharing. We're back to everybody. Well, no, well um, what a fascinating um, story and it just the detail and craftsmanship, absolutely amazing. I've always loved the Tara brooch, but I think I'll have to look at it even more specially now after that wonderful explanation. Um, I'm sure there are some, I know one or two questions have already come in. Um, one has already come in. I don't know if Mark Mark D wants to um, unmute himself. Mark, Mark Doherty. Mark Doherty, sorry, Mark, if you want to ask that question to Neve or. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, Neve. thank you. Thank you for thank you for the talk, Neve. That's the second time I've I've heard it. I, I thought it was worth rehearing to oh, um, make it stick even better. Oh, yeah. 
Um, my question um, is with regard to the the flaw in the, the filigree interlace, could that be intentional? I know that in very oh. complex um, Arabic rugs and the likes, that they intentionally put in a, an, an error to show the fallibility of man. Mm -hmm. Is that possible or is it just damage? Well, it might be because I mean, the Linsuan Gospels, for example, has got some little things on finished bits for example and it has been suggested I didn't know the Arabic artist that's interesting thank you um I mean there's also medieval things they don't want to rival God so you know they, they yes. know they're human it might be we just don't know because of course we just have to guess really because they didn't write anything down so we've really just got the object to go on and of course you know comparing things so it's possible I mean it is yeah. possible it is there any obvious I mean, sign of damage to it, or does it look no. like it's always been in that I position? Right. I mean, I don't think so. It just didn't. I mean, of course, it was tricky. You know, they had all these little tiny, tiny, weeny bits of gold wire, absolutely minuscule, and they had sold them all in place. I mean, they could easily make a mistake, but it could be delivered. Who knows? It's a good suggestion. Imagine giving it to the king and he examines it closely and sees a mistake, though. <laughs> <laughs> this, this could be a cover story, actually. This could be why it happens. Well, indeed. <laughs> Can I? It's, a, it's still close to perfection, though. Oh, it is. It's amazing. And I mean, the R.R. Chalice is the same. And there, but not everything is perfect. You know, there's a comparable approach um, in Edinburgh, which was discovered, actually, in the 50s or 60s, early 60s. Um, in on from our Orkney called the Westman. And it's the same, similar sort of thing, but smaller. And uh, it's been discovered by Robert Stevenson, who was in the National Museum of Antiquities in Scotland, uh, no longer with us, sadly. But, but Robert managed to, um, they took the panels out, they saw that, that there's stamping of the outline on the little gold sheets. But the, the person who did the design the pattern was not the person who did attach the filigree because on one side, one terminal, it's okay, but it's a right mishmash wrong on the other. But the, the pattern that stamped is correct. So the filigree maker, you know, there are errors, mm -hmm. but this is just top of the range stuff, the tar brooch. Oh, the pinnacle. Thank you. Um, Anna Marie McGorian, is it? Anna, Mar Anna Marie, do you want to put the question to Neve? Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been fascinating this evening. Um, I just wondered where the silver and the copper and the gold all came from. Good question. Yes, that is a very good question. I mean, there is native um, silver and native gold uh, available in Ireland. Um, but the question is, did they import it because they weren't used to exploiting it? Um, we don't know. Uh, we do know, there's, um, from Fergus Kelly's wonderful, I don't know if anybody knows this fantastic book, uh, an unpromising title, perhaps early Irish farming, but it, it's, it's what you can extract about um, farming practices uh, from the old Irish, and early bit, old Irish laws. And there is a very interesting passage there about what happens if somebody goes to your, I think, silver mine, I think, and this is ninth maybe nine seconds <coughs> or mine, that it's, it's glossed, I may add with silver. It goes to your mind and takes out metal. It's probably copper because copper was widely available in the Southwest. Extracts the metal without your permission and then they go away and they make something out of it. And it's been glossed to add silver and gold and some other metals. Anyway, I'm glad to tell you that if somebody had the cheek uh, to come along and exploit your mind without your uh, permission and goes away and makes something and you find out by law, they have to give you back, not the thing they've made. Bad luck if it's a wonderful masterpiece, they have to give it back to you. But the reason I mentioned that is because it was glossed in the ninth century to include references to gold and silver. Now we know that gold um, was, uh, when the Anglo-Normans came to Ireland in the late 12th century, uh, Geraldus Cambrensis, uh, who was, whose uncle had, was in the first wave, I think in the 1190s, um, he uh, was recommending to King John that he taxes the Ir he tax the Irish in, in gold with which the island abounds, and there are a number of references to to the use of gold and to the presence of native gold. For example, he had an enemy called Fitzalan, forget his, his name. Anyway, who stalked about the cities of the coals, the coast, gazing with baleful eyes on the interior with, in which gold abounds. Something like I'm not quite quoting Gerardus, but. So definitely there was native gold 
which in my opinion was being exploited to some point. Was it being exploited as early as this? I don't know. I mean, this is a, a there's a big new sort of changeover and it could be that they were importing uh, the silver, which might have been melted down from late Roman silver, and they may have been importing the gold. We actually, uh, Geraldus also mentions um, importation of gold into Ireland. So the answer is I can't tell you exactly uh, where it comes from. Maybe in this period it was being imported, but certainly as time went by, they definitely did start to e e exploit gold. And we know in the Middle Ages, they were exploiting the silver mines in County Tipperary. Um, we don't have any archeological evidence for that at the moment. Robin, you maybe have a question, have you, Robin? Yeah, um, can I be greedy and have three? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. First one, is it, the work of one person or is there a workshop or what? I'd say there's a workshop is my guess. Yeah. It could have been a workshop. Um, it could be that obviously the person who owned this was rich and powerful yeah. um, by the standards of the time. So it could be that say it was uh, at the king of Northern Brega, for example, where the brooch was found, or indeed it could have been the, the king of Tara. I mean, it's not that far away. That's why Waterhouse was sort of able to get away with calling up the Tara brooch. They probably had um, permanent workshops, probably, you know, uh, and the, the goldsmiths wouldn't have supplied the gold. They would have been given the gold and the gold would have been, or, or the silver, you know, the patron would have purchased the materials, given it to the smith to get on with making it. But if you think of, say, St. Patrick's Bell Shrine, which is now in the National Museum of Ireland, but is from the north. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Patrick's Bell Shrine has got an inscription on it. It names the patron, the royal patron, the, the ecclesiastical patron, the registry keeper and the craftsman, and the craftsman is Condulic and his sons. So I think you would have had, you know, traditional crafts where fathers trained up their sons, probably, not their daughters, probably, um, to, uh, to do these crafts. So by the time they sort of got teenagers, they'd be pretty adept and expert, I think. So I think it's very likely that there was a team, yeah. but we, can't, we don't know, of course. Oh, there might have been somebody who was good at making studs. There might have been somebody who was good good at doing filigree. You know, there might have been somebody good at doing the designs. I, we don't know, but that's my guess. Okay, sorry. Second part. Um, any idea how long it might have taken to make? Uh, yes, yes. And that's hard to say. I mean, I was, well, it depends on how many people were working at the same time. I, I can't answer that exactly, but I, I would say that when people have been, you know, doing this skill, and they've been trained up probably from very, very young, they'd probably be relatively quick. I don't think it would have taken years and years. Mm. Um, I can't say exactly. Uh, I mean, there are lots of different processes, aren't there? Um, probably making the wire, you know, making the moulds, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I can't say, but I don't think it would have taken forever. But it wouldn't, you wouldn't have done it in a week either. So the answer is, I don't know exactly, but a real uh, amount of time. The, the third part is, what, what was the status of the goldsmith, the, the person who made the... Really the high. Um, I think the Caird has quite a decent honour price in old Irish law. Yeah. Um, so the, the master craftsmen. Now, uh, there was probably an apprenticeship system and... Uh, like there was for poets, I was at a very interesting lecture actually at the Dublin Institute for um, our, um, DIA, Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. My father was a professor there, so I should know what it's called, but it was at the Celtic Studies Conference. And um, uh, there, that was about uh, poets. They ha it was like, you know, you do your leaving certificate or you do your, 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 your GCSEs and then you do your A-levels and then you do your degree and then you do your masters and then you do your PhD. I mean, there was a kind of system like that for the poets. And, you know, the, in the mid Middle Ages, we know that craftsmen went through various ranks. So, and also there's been interesting work by Jennifer Grothig, um, a friend of mine on looking at the old Irish text, looking at the food rations that was given to craft builders, I think. So the, the top, dog he got quite decent lunches but you know there was lunch for the others it wasn't as good so you know the status of the the master 
was obviously going to be higher than the status of the, the juniors in the team, if that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. All three of them. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, um, Mark Doherty has a second question. I'll go back to Mark then. Thank you. Um, Neve. Um, this isn't actually my question. It's just an observation. Um, uh, well, you, you mentioned about the, the jewellers being like the father and son business. I know of in the days when Belfast jewellers made um, watches and clocks, there's two uh -huh. families in particular, the McCabe's and the McNeil's. And in both those families, uh, they ran the business for at least three generations, passing it on typically from father yeah. to son. They took on their own children as apprentices. And the same, I know of one famous one in London, Fulami on Palmal, and I think they lasted four or five generations. So it's very yeah, um, likely that it's going to have been a family affair to make something like that. Yeah, you see, actually, you've reminded me of something as well, which is the Johnsons. You know, I showed you two replicas, and, and actually the one in the Ulster Museum is slightly later, and it's by Edmund Johnson. And the one in the V&A, <clears throat> which I also played around with, um, that's by Joseph Johnson. The Johnsons were a family of goldsmiths in Dublin, and they went generation to generation as well. So that just sure. is to support what you're saying. Yeah, a bit of a, a, a universal thing in, in society, possibly. Yeah, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, you could train up your children. I think it would make sense. And I mean, the other thing about it is they probably started young. So they, they got really quite good, quite young, I would think. Oh, and actually, that's another very important factor. Young eyes, they didn't have glasses okay. like we have. You, you yeah. want young eyes to do very, very fine yeah. work like that. I think that's a very good point. And... Um, Actually, um, I was talking about this to a gemologist friend of mine only last week. And what he said is all this talk about quartz magnifying glasses. He said, if our, in antiquity, you, know, you get lots of quartz thing, lenses in from ancient Egypt. You get them actually, there's a big Viking find on from one of the islands off the east coast of, of Sweden. But uh, he says that, that they wouldn't work as magnifying glasses because apparently to get proper magnification with quartz, you have to slice it, it totally accurately through the C axis, whatever the C axis is. But anyway, yeah. it has to go right through. If you don't do it accurately, what happens is you get double vision. So what he thinks that these are for is uh, to, to focus the light. You can, you can focus the light through a, a, a lens of... of, of um, of course, and what you really need to do is be able to see number one. And on the question of young eyes, what he pointed out is that apparently there is um, a, 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 an inscription on a gravestone from Rome lamenting the death of the, the, the best gem engraver of his generation, the great hope of his family and of the Roman world, uh, lamenting his death at the age of, wait for this, 12 years and so many months. And that's oh. about young eyes, yeah. Uh, so ideally, it'd be, they would be made by young eyes in the summertime. Exactly, when you can see, yeah, outside. Um, so so I, I'll try and be brief then, i will come to my question now. I'm particularly fascinated for a long time by the, the Celtic High Crosses in Ireland yes. and, and their evolution. And of course, the, 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 this jewellery, like the tar brooch, etc., and the... The eliminated Gospels are older than those crosses. Do you see yeah. much um, correlation in the design? I would interpret it as they they, they were inspired by the jewellery and took the, those original designs, the interlace, the knotwork, the bosses, yeah. and just scaled it up in stone. Yes, I mean, it, I think it's certainly true of the Henny group of crosses. Yes, fabulous. Is there wet like wooden crosses with plaques on them, like the... Um, Oh dear, there's a, a, a cross, Tullinally cross in the National Museum, quite a new find actually. And that really does look like um, probably trying to represent the, the cross at Jerusalem, which was a dual cross, but their idea of a dual cross was not the Byzantine idea of a dual cross. So it's it, the idea of the, the, the true cross, but, but the, you know, the, the Irish idea, because after all, they're a long way from Jerusalem, they couldn't see the, um, the ones which were erected on the hill of Golgotha by the emperors. 
So um, in the sixth century, there's one and the one before. So yeah, I think so. But there's a there is continuity. I mean, it's quite interesting on Wirdox. No, not Wirdox. The uh, the high the other the tall cross at Monster Boys. Um, you get yes, the the, the West Cross. Yeah, well, yeah, and you get little hidden crosses there, not not found on the trial book, but f are found on the Ardai Chalice. So I think the Ardai Chalice is no later than the early 9th century. It's very hard to pinpoint a date. But so the, obviously these designs get into the repertory, but, you know, some of them would definitely originate probably in metalwork. But we, we have lost, you know, we've lost wood, we've lost embroidery, you know, we don't have anything like a complete original record, but certainly... Amazing, uh, amazingly, some of the oldest things we have are very fragile books. Well, yes. I mean, imagine finding a book, you know, uh, in a bog, you know, the, um, the, the, the Psalter found in the bog near Bar in Tipperary by the, the, the man digging turf with a big machine. He actually managed to discover that. But... Yes, I think of the Book of Duro, that, like, it still exists, whereas the whole abbey and village and mill and castle are all gone, but this book still remains. Well, exactly. I'm, I'm oh, and the cross. To, I'm now going to sort of call time. I know there was another Thank question, you. but in fact, your answer to Mark uh, covered that. So oh. on behalf of the Kale History Society, as I'm only hosting this by Zoom, um, I'd like to thank me very much for... Um, given us an amazing insight into the Tower approach and uh, on behalf of everybody and thank you all our special guests who joined us as well this evening. We look forward to another talk on Zoom. So thank you very much, everybody.